first of all, thank you guys for joining um, for our final financial literacy class for COVID-19 edition. Um, it's been a blast. Usually Larry sets it off, but this time I'm going to start it off. So um, bear with me. So as you know, we're, our name of our program is called Financially Clean. Um, the team is myself, Dion Nichols, Mr. 850, Larry, Tang, Adam Starr, and Kevin Keogh. Did I say it right, Kevin? I hope so. This is yeah. this this to you by Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams. We plan on um, starting our 12-week series probably somewhere in late spring, early summer. You know, with everything going on, I don't want to give a hard date yet, but we plan on doing another a webinar. Hopefully, you guys will, will register for the for the upcoming webinar. Next slide. Class updates. Um, please, please, please follow us on Two Black Guys with Good Credit. We also archive all the past episodes, and today's episodes will be available as well on our podcast to stream pot, Two Black Guys with Good Credit, and it'll come on Thursday. And you can also even listen to Dion's first uh, life coaching class that did extremely well, and that already that's on our podcast stream as well, and she'll have her second upcoming class this Tuesday. Thursday. And you can also, oh, this Thursday, sorry, today's Tuesday. This Thursday, thank you. From six to seven, same time. And you can register with Dion at, Dion, where, we, where do they register? They can go to Eventbrite. They can go to my page, Live Your Best Life For You, on Instagram and on Facebook for the link. Exactly. Okay, next slide. What's new? What's happening in the last week? Well, states are slowly allowing businesses to open. I know California is partially opening. I know Georgia partially opening. And um, there's, there's a new norm, as you guys noticed, that one, when stores are opening, they're only limiting the amount of people that can come into each store. I'm sure you've all have experienced a long line. You've all have seen, seen it yourself and witnessed it yourself. Restaurants, you're gonna be able to have to sit six feet apart from people. Um, why am I telling you this and why, how does it affect business? Well, they're saying for one, the airplane line, the airplanes, the flights are not going to have the middle seat anymore. And some flights are going to actually put up um, plastic dividers. And because they don't have the middle seat, guess who's going to be paying for that seat? You as a consumer. So expect airline prices to go up. Restaurants, the same thing. They can't fold to capacity. So they're going to have to pass on some of the costs to, to, to us, the consumers. So expect restaurant prices to go up. Um, things are going to go up because we can't, you know, we have to social distance. That six feet apart is six feet, a distance of revenue that is not, that is not going to be able to be, um, to be received anymore from these businesses. So in, in essence, they're going to have to increase their cost and you, we're going to feel it. Sorry, I don't have, I don't see the slides anymore, Larry. I don't know what happened. Uh, everyone Larry? Else, it's still, they're still there. They should still be there. No, I'm not seeing them. Should I, does everyone else see them? No, I don't see them. No. Let me try again. I see them. No, I'm not seeing them. Okay. Yeah, I might. So with all of this happening, you can expect that things, there's good, things are going to go up, in which in essence is going to be an inflationary period. Um, the Paycheck Protection Program, it resumed on April 27th with $3.2 billion. New fund already fifty and it's not even. Larry, Sean, I think you cut out again. Sorry, you could you repeat that last part about the Paycheck Protection Program? The Paycheck Protection Program. They've already depleted 50% of the funds of the $3.310 billion that was put into the market on the 27th of April. So a week later, already half of it's gone. Next. What are we gonna talk about today? We're putting in perspective into the downturn, investing strategically in the new norm, and then class wrap up and Q&A. 
next. Disclaimer that everybody should know, uh, nobody uh, on this team is a licensed um, financial advisor. And you know, just a little bit of my background, I, I have worked on Wall Street, I'm not licensed, but you know, I wanted to be able to create a program where I wasn't, I wasn't being influential in any way. There was nobody, had it, we didn't have any hidden agendas. We just wanted to teach financial literacy. So that being why, you know, we are just having, we're just people that really want to, you know, educate people on just financing and investing without, you know, without some kind of invest in this, buy this from us, buy that without a salesy, salesy pitch. I think that's what people have loved about our program is that there's not a pressure thing that they feel. So, um, yeah, so just put a disclaimer, although we're going to give you some financial tips, it's not coming from anybody licensed. So take it as you will. Okay, so let's talk about the history. Can everybody still hear me? Clear me, please give me a thumbs up if you can hear me all right, and I'm not coming in and out. You're coming in good. Okay, cool. Um, history shows, you know, this draft, I think, Larry, you want to, you want to explain this or you want me to go through this? Um, either one, whatever you're comfortable with. Go ahead. You do it and I'll follow in with you. Cool. Wonderful. Um, thanks, Sean. So, you know, what we wanted to do was just give sort of a little high level view before diving into the details. Um, obviously there's been a lot of talk uh, about what's going on in the market. Uh, people are saying different things. So we want to present everything here and give, again, give you the facts so you can understand what's, what's actually going on. So I think the first message that we want to say is history shows there is no need to panic when things happen to the economy. Uh, it might seem tough, it might seem scary, but the market, it's natural, goes through corrections and recoveries, goes up and down. For example, in 2008, you know, the market was, the, if you look at the S&P 500, it was down almost 50% at one point. Uh, and then following that, we had a 10-year period of just up and up and up, right? And if you look out to the chart on the right and you sort of zoom out, right, this is sort of a, a, a look at all the recent recessions uh, over, let's say, the last uh, 40 years or so and also the long-term average since 1948. Right, and if you look at the low point, the one year from the low point, two years from the low point, I think it's pretty clear the message that things come back and you have to zoom up for the big picture. So what's the lesson? The lesson is when is the right time to invest? Always, and obviously always if you can. Um, and the other one is, is to be patient and we're gonna talk about that a little bit more uh, because you, know, you have to be in this for the long term because things are gonna be bumpy in the shorter term. So, Again, going back to this uh, situation with the economy, there's good news and there's bad news. Let's start with the bad first. I promise you there's good news. But in terms of what's actually going on, I think everyone knows that the economy has been hit hard. Unemployment spiked up. It was 10% in, in March. People are saying that once the April numbers come out, it should be closer to 15, 20. So that's, that's a lot. Um, and Moody's, which is one of the you know, big three credit agencies in the U.S., uh, you know, I looked at a presentation from them a couple of weeks ago and, you know, they're looking at probably single digit unemployment rate for at least a year or two. So whereas, you know, in the beginning of the crisis, when things started, uh, you know, getting serious, people said that they were looking at more of a V shape economy to go down than rebound immediately. Now that we're sort of in the thick of things, now that, you know, people are saying there might be a second wave, who knows, no one really knows, things might be a little bit more complicated. Uh, and so, you know, the important thing is to be prepared for that. Uh, in terms of where we are, it's technically the worst job market in American history. You know, if you look at something like the unemployment numbers, the good news or sort of the devil's advocate side of that is, you know, we know exactly why that's happening, right? We know it's because people just can't go to work. People just can't open their businesses. So if people can't open their businesses, unemployment's going to go up. We also know on the flip side that once things do open, it's gonna come back down. So eventually there is a solution, right? Whereas in 2008, I think a lot of people were really scared, didn't really know what the, what the solution was. Um, here we have visibility to that. Uh, that so being, I just, yep. Yeah, so just even just to, to elaborate on what Larry's saying is that, you know, we know what the fix is to this economy, what's happening is as soon as this pandemic kind of stabilized, the curve flattens, everybody's gonna go back to work. Every economy should should change in an upward motion when you think about it. 
how high, how how high will it go? How fast? That's the uh, that's the unknown. But at the end of the day, I think you know what you should be taking from this is that there the economy is going to turn. You know, it'll turn, and like everything else, historic historically has shown is that you know whenever they, there's a downturn in the market, it, it eventually will start to go back up again. So I'm not telling you that you should be that you not you shouldn't worry, but you shouldn't be in panic mode and thinking that the world is going to end, especially if you, especially young people that's never really experienced a downward market like this before or similar to this, that, you know, history has shown that this happens and the market will adjust. Absolutely, Sean. Uh, you know, but diving in, in terms of what, what's actually been happening, again, the facts, GDP for the first quarter, so January, February, March, was down about 4.8% compared to the same period of last year, right? And again, why is that the case? Well, consumer spending was down something like 8%. And we, we know why that's the case, because people can't go out. They can't go out. They can't buy stuff. They can't travel. They can't spend money on entertainment. Um, so that's going to happen. That being said, again, you know, we've seen a lot of spikes. People are staying at home. They're buying groceries. They're buying home products. Uh, and this time around, because e-commerce has been so pervasive through society, uh, it's actually pretty easy to stay home and buy, you know, if you want something, you can kind of buy it, most things. And so, honestly, when I looked at it personally, uh, when I saw that consumer spending was down 8%, I actually thought, wow, only 8%? Wouldn't that be more? Uh, so I was actually somewhat surprised, but not that it's not that it's a great thing. And as compared to, you know, the long-term U.S. sort of GDP growth of around, let's say, 2 to 4%, it is a big difference. It is a big drop. So it's nothing to scoff at. And the other thing is that, it's pretty rare for the entire economy to be in recession at the same time. Um, you know, even during the financial crisis, the U.S. was not doing very well, Europe was not doing very well, but Asia comparatively was sort of the growth factor that was lifting us out of that recession. Uh, right now, that's more uncertain. Obviously, you know, China is starting to open up uh, because they were the first wave, so we'll see what happens. But, you know, currently things are a little bit muddied in that sense. And so, as I promised... I what, guess in this, in this, in this scenario, Misery does love company. Misery does love company. Uh, but there is good news, all right? There is good news, and we're here to give you that good news. Uh, first thing I'll say is, you know, the pockets of the economy, they're doing well. Residential housing prices, if you look at the fundamentals, what sort of economists look at to measure health, is doing pretty well, actually, right now. Whereas, you know, obviously, in, during the crisis, uh, that was the catalyst for, you know, a lot of the issues that were happening. Um, secondly, the government has been very fast and aggressive about enacting policy to help, you know, bolster the economy. Uh, first of all, you know, an example of that, the Fed said interest rates are zero. And what that means is, you know, a lot of the debt out there, a lot of the lending that banks do, a lot of any of that is based on this Fed interest rate. And so, you know, the Fed lowering rates means that they're encouraging people to go and lend and lend cheaply so more people will take out business loans and, and so forth. Uh, combined, the Fed has had issued, I think, a little over $2 trillion. The government is also, through the CARES Act, which we talked about in class one, has also uh, issued a $2 trillion bill. So combined, it's over $4 trillion of support, $4 trillion of support, again, uh, in the economy through various facilities, lending facilities, and other sort of initiatives. We won't get into all that because it's very complicated, but it is, sort of unprecedented how fast the Fed and the government is acting. So that is good news. And for those of you guys who are invested in the market, and we asked that question earlier, it seems like it's a pretty good mix. Some are, some aren't. The stock markets have had the best April in the last 82 years, which sounds kind of crazy given what we've seen, right? Uh, so I will add a caveat in that and say that stock markets are sometimes fickle. They are supposed to be forward looking. And again, they can be bumpy, especially when we go into times of economic uncertainty. So it's not unreasonable to say that it can go up and it can go down. Uh, but, you know, again, these are just the facts. So I'll turn it back over to, to Sean to talk about the opportunities, the, the, the micro. So what are the opportunities? Like Larry just, like we were saying all along from the beginning of all the classes, the stock market has been, due to the stock market falling, that means prices, stock prices have been, to me, discounted or I would like to say on sale. So there's an opportunity for you to get into the market 
And there's many ways in which I think you can penetrate the market. And we're going to talk about that later. You may not just necessarily have to buy individual stocks to be part of the market. You may not, you don't even have to spend, you could spend less than a hundred dollars and still be part of the market. So don't think you need deep pockets to actually become active in the market. But if you want to be active in the market, I think now is a great time to, to enter the market. If you haven't before, maybe we should do a survey. How many people have actually investing in somewhat in the market, whether it's your mutual funds, exchange traded funds. So we did, Sean, we, you're cutting so, a bit, but we did that. We just did that. It seems like it's a pretty even mix. It's tied to Sean. Okay. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Did the Wonderful. The results were showing that it's a pretty even mix between people who are you know, like roughly, I'd say a quarter, quarter, quarter of people who are invested, uh, somewhat invested, just starting, plan to invest, and not invested at all. So you're getting... Well, I, I went deeper into the market. I invested more money in the market. I would say for those that haven't invested, you can go to call your local bank and just, you know, allocate maybe $10 a week if you can, $20 a week towards, um, towards, uh, um, towards investing in the market by purchasing some kind of fund which would actually get you activated and be part of the market. So I think you should take advantage of, of what's happening and, um, and look to invest. And those that are already in the market and they can afford to, if they can invest a little bit more, if it's $10, $20 more a week, I would I'd recommend to do so. Um, availability of loans. This is something that I've been taking advantage of. I've been re trying to refinance my properties. Um, I've transferred balance, balance transferred debt over so that I'm getting the discounted rates right now. Rates are very low. And when you look back at these times 20 years ago, that's one thing people, historians will be talking about how low interest rates were and that it's up to you to take advantage of these low rates. I would recommend every and everybody to figure out all their expenses and what debt they're carrying and call their creditors or find other creditors that'll give them a discounted rate on, the, on their loan. You're breaking up, Sean, a little bit. Refining better now? Yes. Yep. Sean. Yeah, you yeah you're better. Hear me? Last ten seconds or so. No. Should I call in from my phone? Maybe I'll do it from my phone. Maybe I'll, I'll do better. What do you think? It's up to you. I probably may have a better opportunity. All right. Give me. Can everybody hear me? Okay now. Yep. But no. you might want to call in. Okay. As okay. All right, let me let me try to call in from my phone. Give me two minutes, everybody. Sorry well, Sean, that. let me add in while you do that, that um, you are right that the markets are pretty cheap now, that a lot of the great companies are for sale. I would look at, um, personally speaking, um, just being able to watch the necessity companies, healthcare, healthcare. for one, um, companies that are in transportation, these are necessity companies, delivery companies, number two. Um, also, I look at what's not necessary in my life and review what's yesterday for us, some of the things I have in my life. So we're in a new normal. So some of the things I valued before I don't value anymore, um, for an example. Uh, a lot of my clothes I just got rid of. They're, um, to me, they're not necessary. I can't speak for anyone else but myself, but um, I'm in the process of being as light as I can in the event that things may go either way, whether they go good or bad, or up or down, I'm looking to be able to um, evaluate having uh, the largest line of credit I can possibly have to um, utilize either going forward in other business ideas that I have or utilizing some real estate ventures that I think I can take advantage of and um, just move on these issues if they are available and I'm, I'm in a good financial position to take advantage of this. So yeah, we are in a, we're in a, position right now where no one can truly predict the outcome. I don't bet against America because the America, the core of America are very um, self-striving, self-sufficient self type of people. 
So I, that's how I like to be. And uh, so I won't bet against America. I just look at that America is not going to be the same and that each of us has to review what we have and what is different in our life. Um, so we can take advantage of being strong when this economy recovers. I'm back. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay, wonderful. That much better? Yeah. I can just, hear you clearly. And just to add to what, what um, Mr. 850 is saying, you know, I am so busy all week from 5.30 in the morning till 8.30, 9.30. And I'm speaking to different people that are just taking advantage of this market, that are finding opportunities, like, like Mr. 850 said, trying to position themselves, reposition their debt, make themselves available to obtain credit. I myself, I'm doing that. That's why I'm here late at work because I was actually faxing stuff to my, um, my banker at TD Bank to get this refinance done. So it's up to you to really take advantage of what's happening in the market and try to, even if it means like a, a young lady called me today asking me, she got her first unemployment check. She says she's actually making more money. She used to work at a gym. She's making more money being at home got on unemployment than she was at the gym. What should she do with the extra money? It was a very simple response, pay off your credit card debt. And that's what she's putting in the money towards. So there are little things that you can do to make, put yourself in a better position um, in this current market. And I know some of you are listening and you're like, well, you know, I'm just making ends meet. I'm not, I don't have this extra income like Sean is talking about. Um, well then, you know, be creative and work on your brand, work on yourself, work on that. You can, you can put yourself in a different position in a higher income bracket. You know, what do I need to do? You know, my FedEx delivery guy came here today and we had that same discussion like, okay, You've been with FedEx for a number of years. What is the next move for you? What is the next position? How can you get there? What courses are FedEx is FedEx offering for you to, to move up the ladder? Um, investing yourself is the most important investment. I'm sure Mr. 850 can agree that, and I can agree most definitely, that it may sound intangible, but it's really a realistic thing. If I didn't invest in myself and believe in myself, I would not have been able to do the things I've done. And I'm sure... Uh, Mr. 850 can concur to that. I'm sure Deanna, so everybody listening can concur to that. So there are things that you need to work on. We talked about last week, even taking a, 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 an online course from a reputable school that can just, that little, that course can just do wonders to your resume. Um, next screen. Big picture investment perspectives. If you can, can afford to keep investing, then then continue to do so. You know, the market, like we said before, market downturns are a great time to buy assets at a discount. I myself did it. I continued to invest. I continued to try to put a little bit more, not much more in the market so that I could, you know, it's called, um, um, it's called really hedging yourself against the market, meaning that, okay, I'm, not, I'm gonna make monthly, weekly contributions and, and, and looking at the long-term algorithm of it, that in the long run, I'm going to have an overall positive rate of return rather than saying, I'm just going to invest one set of money at one particular period and then stay out of the market and come back again, and invest in those. I can, I advise you to, uh, to continue to make the regular contributions into the market. Do not try to time the market, meaning that the best of the best, the scholars of scholars trying to figure out when is the best time to invest, when is not the best time to invest, the market's this, the market's that. As I said, continuing, what is it? Continue making regular contributions in the market is the best way to take advantage of the market. Waiting for the right moment. I have known people, I, I, they may be even listening to this, that have waited, said they're going to wait, keep waiting, continue to wait, and never enter the market. And studies have shown that if you do that, you'll miss out on opportunities. Even the best money managers, they, 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 they don't beat the market in the long term. It's really about just regular contributions into the market. And I always say the market for me is not a place where I'm expecting to win the lottery. I'm not expecting to be the next Warren Buffett from the market. I'm just expecting to get steady, positive returns and then continue to invest in myself, continue to do other things to grow. But the market is something that I'm going to look, look for to give me nice, positive returns along the way. So then when I, I, if I need it, I can access it to use it to invest once again in myself and my ideas, or it can help plan for my future and my retirement. And Sean, as, as a reinforcement of that, you know, what, what he was, what Sean was talking about earlier with the, you know, investing a little bit, 
uh, at a time is is that next bullet we have is dollar cost averaging and what what that really means is just you know if you put in consistently a, a bunch of money on a recurring basis it matters less when you put it in because you're just averaging out you know what your cost basis is over time and to the second point when sean says he's not warren buffett none of us are right um even for people who work in financial services we have a lot of other things to do and you know unless you have a lot of time to devote to studying this generally generally speaking for most people if the best money managers can't beat the market uh then you know why should we think that way this is not this is not something about our ego this is not something about you know how self-confident you are it has nothing to do with that these are sort of in the financial world what we sort of call the laws of physics and you just have to you know investing is all about risk management and you just have to as sean said uh, spread out your risk diversify your risk and make sure that you know you are you know building your wealth no matter what happens correct right. and when you, and when you hear people talking about oh i was able to buy amazon stock when it was at a dollar i got into google when i was at five dollars and i bought facebook and now i made all these millions those are diamonds in the rough and they're not even telling you the one the stocks that they lost on the money with the stocks that they bought that didn't pan out to anything that they, that they didn't make money on you know so i would not recommend just stock picking cherry picking i would just spread it across spread it across the board dollar cost averaging as larry said but also a good thing to hedge yourself if you do actively get into the stock market is fixed income meaning you know i like high high yield high yield saving cd high yield savings accounts you know, I just I just actually opened up one with um, Goldman Sachs, Marcus Goldman Sachs, which was a rate of 1.7%, which was decent. And then also they have no fee CDs. I don't know if everybody's heard about that, but they're great. I mean, you can open up a seven month, nine month, 12 month CD. And if you have to withdraw the money, they're not going to charge you a penalty for it. And this is really a fairly new product to the market. So I would say, you know, if you want to do something no risk or low risk, they say everything is risky, but really and truly it's, it's minimal to no risk. Um, a CD is a good way to do it, and a, and a no fee CD is good because if you have to take the money out, they're not you're not going to be charged for it. And it's like I said, a good way to balance your portfolio. Um, next slide, Larry. Thoughts down the road. This is you, Larry, right? I think you're nope, going to speak to this you. one. That's me. That's you. But I okay. Mean, I can, Go ahead. I mean, I can talk about it. You know, Go ahead. Sort of the macro thing. Uh, people are going to say there's a lot of projections for what might happen and a lot of projections for what might not happen. Um, in the end, the best projections are still a guess. Uh, so, you know, in the end, I think that's that's why the importance of diversification is there because you need to hedge yourself for the unknown, right? Uh, people talk about inflation more specifically a little bit more. You know, people were saying now that the Fed is putting all this money into the economy, is that going to lead to inflation? Um, not necessarily. You know, according to that same source, according to Moody's again, you know, they think it's it's unlikely to see we're unlikely to see broad inflation at least in the short term because inflation, if you think about it, is sort of the, is is defined as you know the price of just overall goods increasing right in the economy and if there are poor labor conditions and there's no wage growth for an extended period of time, uh, if unemployment is you know going to stay around for an extended period of time, then you're unlikely to see that inflation, right? In the longer term, we're not sure, but in the shorter term, um, it's it's probably less likely than likely. And again, have we hit rock bottom? It's really hard to tell. You know, the, you can read as much as you want, uh, but you know, there's always a risk of having a second wave, there's always a risk of opening too early, there's always a risk of, you know, something else happening, right? So, again, the most important part is when you're dealing with uncertainty is to make sure that you're diversified against all the risks. Putting all your eggs in one basket is probably not the smartest thing to do right now. I just want to say, as a, as a, just as a note, um, we're trying to evolve our program, meaning um, having multiple people speak to you giving their perspective on things so i'm not the only one speaking so if the transitions are not as smooth as they should be just bear with us but the goal of the program is to keep continuing to grow and to give you the best advice as possible so we're trying to add more people to it get more people involved 
get you their experience. And so um, you can really leave with a really well-informed program. So just bear with us if the transitions aren't as smooth as uh, they have been in the classes is because we're really trying to get uh, more people actively involved in, in, in the class. Yeah, so, so I'm going to turn it over to Kevin really quickly. Uh, as, as Sean introduced in the beginning, Kevin is, you know, has been one of our fact checkers for the last uh, three classes, but you know, Kevin's on our associate board. He's a really smart guy along with Adam. They both actually work at City, City Group uh, in the corporate and investment bank. So very, very smart guys, very, very plugged in. And you know, he's going to spend a little bit of time talking about sort of how to think about investing in the current environment in the yeah. new. Sure. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, everybody. So um, if you've made the decision that you actually want to start investing, you have to think for yourself, you know, how do I invest in the new normal, right? Um, and if you're in a position where you can invest, for the people who haven't invested before, uh, I wanted to frame this quick discussion around, you know, what are the things you think about when, you, when you're ready to start investing? And you got to go back to your first principles, right? The first thing you should ask yourself is, why are you investing? And, you know, you could be investing for a number of reasons. Um, but the most common reason that people start saving and why I think everybody should, should save you know, now is for retirement. Because I don't think you want to work until you're 80 years old, although some people end up doing that. Uh, I, I looked just quickly before I, I logged in today, and it, it's 17% of people ages 50 and up in the U.S., right, have no retirement savings whatsoever. So that means they're probably going to have to keep working for a long time. So the first thing you should do is always invest for retirement. Um, the power of compound interest uh, means time is money for you. So you start investing today, even if it's a little bit, if it's just $10, $20 in your paycheck, put it into, you know, a low cost fund or a low cost, you know, exchange traded fund and just let it sit. Don't worry about it. Let it go forever. Uh, if you're lucky enough to work for a company that offers a 401k match, right, or a, a safe harbor contribution, which means management puts money aside for you, um, absolutely take advantage of it. Uh, 401k match basically means for every percentage point, you know, of investment that you put in uh, up to a certain level, the company's going to give you that money in a match. I mean, you get 100% return. Uh, you're really not going to beat that return anywhere. So paramount is to save for retirement. That should be your first goal. Um, but if, if it's not for retirement, if you're saving for some other objective, then you know, continue to save uh, as best you can. Take out small pay uh, chunks from your paycheck. Again, five, 10, 20 bucks. Set up an auto withdrawal from a, a discount brokerage or an app, right? So you don't even see it. You don't even get used to seeing it leave your paycheck every week. You just, you, it's automatic and then you check in later. Uh, and you realize you've got a nest egg saved up. Uh, and another important question is after you determine why you're investing, are you saving for a particular goal or for retirement or, or what have you, um, understand your risk tolerance. So are you saving for something where material loss of money, right, it, it would, would be a real problem for you? Um, I have a friend who was saving for a house, right? He had his down payment for a house or an apartment uh, in the market, uh, and he was planning on buying this year. Well, he's not buying this year anymore, right, because of what happened in March. Um, so depending on what your goal is, right, saving for a house on the stock market is dangerous. Uh, so you need to think about, you know, what, what, what I'm doing, right, would I be okay if my savings goal was delayed by a number of years, right? If you need money safely, you shouldn't be in the stock market, right? You should be investing in like a CD or a high yield savings account, that kind of thing, which ties into my next point, right? Be wary of your cash needs. So if you, if you run a business, right, and you've got credit card debt, um, or you've got some other, you know, use of funds that you need, don't, don't play with your money in the stock market. Uh, one of the most important things you should set up, especially in this environment, is an emergency fund. You want to cover three to six months of your expenses uh, in a fund. What happens if you lose your job? What happens if you get sick, right, and you have a medical uh, episode, right, where you have a lot of money you got to lay out all of a sudden? Don't, don't pick individual stocks and start playing because it's fun. If you did, at the end of the day, you've, you've got your retirement fund, you, know, you funded your retirement, you've got your emergency fund, you've got your credit card debt paid off, uh, and you do have some money to play with, then you can go ahead and, you know, pick a, pick a company that you're interested in or you're passionate about and put some money into it. Um, I like some of these, these applications, these websites we have listed on the page, Betterment, Stash, uh, Acorns, Wealthfront. Um, there's another other ones out there, of course. Uh, there are sort of alternative options to using a, like a large discount brokerage like a Vanguard, a Fidelity, or a Schwab, a Meritrade, that kind of thing. Um, these guys have more friendly um, user interfaces. It's easier to get started. They don't offer all the bells and whistles of a, like a Vanguard or a Schwab. You're not going to have research or tax advice or that kind of thing. But often when you're just getting started, you don't really need that. It's more important that you can, you know, use an app, set it up um, to automatically debit from your, your checking account, right? and just let it go. 
Uh, so, you know, those are the things that I think about when I, when I think about getting invested in the market in the new norm. Kevin, may I add one more, only because I'm yeah. the only female on the team. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, there is a, um, a, a site or app called Elvest, which is a platform specifically for women uh, who do actually invest differently than men. So they specifically cater to women. And as Kevin mentioned, um, you can get in with actually zero dollars. You can start with very little. Um, so a little barrier to entry. It takes literally 10 minutes to, to sign up. So they really make it easy. Um, if it's at least one way to just tow, tow your way into getting into the market. Um, so everything that, that Kevin said, accessible, financial, um, you know, it's affordable and makes uh, investing accessible. And I'll, I'll add something along that lines too. Um, two things actually. Someone uh, asked a really good question just now. Um, Layla, I think, asking that they noticed that Robinhood wasn't mentioned on the platform. Obviously, Robinhood, for people who don't know, is, is, a, is a pretty popular online uh, brokerage that competes with a lot of the traditional ones, um, mostly on, on stocks. Um, and, you know, it's not that we're favoring any of these platforms that we're showing around here. These are just examples. You know, you feel free to go on and, and, and try all of them, ask around, ask your friends, you know, go to your financial advisor, go to a brokerage, ask the more traditional ones. Uh, you know, I think the point is that I, I just shared this poll result here. You guys should see that we asked, you know, what we want. We were curious on what people were exposed to. And it seems like everyone is mostly 82% of you guys are invested in stocks in some form or another, right? 41% in fixed income. Half of you guys have some cash. Uh, and then the rest uh, split up uh, with real estate and other investments. So, you know, when, when we talk about investing uh, to most people, it does sound like it does seem, I guess, it seems like it's about stocks, but as Sean has mentioned, there's more than that, right? There are many other asset classes. And in order to be truly diversified, right, from all the different risks that can happen, you want to be investing across all these different asset classes. And the beauty of these platforms that we, we showed here, I personally, I'm a, I'm a Wealthfront user, not vouching for them. They're not paying me. But I like the fact that I can set up an account there and they ask a couple simple questions. As, as Kevin mentioned, it's very user-friendly. They ask a couple simple questions about what your risk preference is, like what you're willing to risk, what your you know return expectations are, and then they just do everything for you, right? And they give you a very diversified portfolio. Um, and if you want to customize that and you have the time to do it, so be it. But I like the fact that I press a button, I set up my direct deposit, and I leave it alone, and I've left it alone for four or five years now. So that's that's my experience. I don't, I'll give you I'll, 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 real quick. Um, I'm, I'm after you, Mr. 850. All right. So I just want to mention that from the perspective of being on the retirement side already, so everyone's leaning to go there, and I'm telling you that you get there pretty quick. Uh, as someone who worked um, and then retired from my job, and now my wife is retired, and now we're both looking at the um, nest egg that we set aside. So all the things we're sharing with you, um, many of them we were able to put into effect and we're reaping the benefit. We've made many mistakes along the way, um, but we've made a lot of good investments, or I should say we made more good investments than we made bad investments. So from that standpoint, we now are looking at weathering this storm and helping other people who are closest to us weather this storm as we go forward. So all this information, I'm, I'm a user of Acorn. Uh, my kids use Stash. And um, so, you know, all of these options are good if you utilize them and not wait. And that's the main point I think we're trying to get across to everyone. You can put in as little as, what, $25 or even less than that. and. Uh, just keep that money growing as you go forward. All right, let me, just, let, let me just summarize, you know, what kind of all of this means. You know, I'm in my 40s, so I would say like I'm kind of somewhat mid-range. You know, when I was in my 20s and my 30s, you know, we, we hear, and if anybody is in their 20s or 30s listening, you're hearing about, oh, invest, invest, you know, try to grow your portfolio, try to do this, try to that. And when I was in it, in my, I didn't really truly kind of start to understand what it all means till I start getting into my 40s and I'm kind of seeing what it means 
what you're trying to set yourself up for is that your investments will begin to start working for you. All right. And when I say start working for you is meaning that you can live off the dividend payments, live off the cash flow that your investments bring. Cause at my age now, I'm really just trying to work towards cash flow, making sure my real estate positions are giving me positive cash flow, making sure my other, my, investments in stocks bonds are giving me positive cash flow so i can utilize that cash flow to live and then my investments my real estate my stocks hopefully i don't have to tap too deep into it and i can leave those behind for the next generation to continue so when you think of big picture and when you're thinking about investing you could th you should be thinking of a, what can this bring me down the road what can this investment bring me what kind of return can it bring me because i realize my perception is that if you can get to yourself to certain monthly cash flow that supports your lifestyle and your investments kind of stay where they are, grow a little bit as you get older, then you're doing okay. You're doing well. And I think that's what, you know, in your twenties, I always say it's about education In your thirties. It's about beginning to start to invest and, and, and really go aggressive in your forties. It's you start to see those things work for you. Now, if you're already in your forties, you're like, well, I'm already in my forties, Sean. I, I missed some time and I've then it's still not too late because the mistakes that I made when I was young, I was really going heavy into real estate and I was not really doing the, I wasn't playing the stock market. I wasn't getting into funds because I was just figured, my theory was, well, what I'm doing in real estate is outperforming the market. So why should I go anywhere else? I, was, I would have debates with brokers and guys that are heavy into the market over my position in real estate. But what I think I missed out that opportunity, I would have liked to have done both, to be making weekly contributions and still doing real estate. So I have different angles and different things working. And what I learned in investing, you're not going to win on all points. And you look at your overall rate of return, meaning your rate of return from what you got in the market, as far as stocks, what you got in fixed income security, which is CDs. But I looked at CDs like, I'm not putting all this money in CDs to get one and 2%, but it creates a balance. Then you look at what you're doing in real estate and other investments. And you know, I always tell people, it's not about hitting home run in investments. You know, if I give you a baseball analogy, or if anybody out there plays cricket, I even love the cricket analogy even better if anybody knows cricket, but I won't just in case you don't understand cricket. But if baseball analogy, you know, what everybody hears is that I have to hit a home run. There's people out there that you don't hear about, you don't read about, they're not the Warren Buffett of this world, but they're getting singles, they're getting doubles. And those are great investments where they're maybe not hitting double digit returns to getting seven and 8%, but it's steady, constant growth. Trying to hit a home run is like you're swinging so hard that you're gonna, you could fly out very easily. If you just take your time and bat and try to get a single or double, there's a less likelihood that you'll strike out. And that's kind of the analogy you're using cricket. Everybody knows cricket. Like you can get six runs if you hit it over the fence. You can get four if you just hit it to the wall and you get ones and singles. But if you keep trying to hit that six, you're eventually going to pop out, right? So to me, it's like, you don't know cricket, but to me, home run analogy, you're, the tr if you're trying to, those home run sluggers, they strike out a lot or they fly out a lot. They hit fly balls. So if you hit singles and doubles, you'll stay longer in the game. You'll last a little bit longer. I, you don't have to go for gold, just steady, constant growth and understand that you're not going to win on everything. And everybody, and they, when they used to say, you know, don't check your account, don't check your portfolio because some days it's down, some days out. It's very true. But it'll eventually all work out if you make consistent investment and you learn to diversify yourself. That, that brings us to the next screen. Diversify yourself. It's the key. And it's diversifying across all sectors, including yourself. Like for me, I always thought in business that I tried to not make, I try to create, get involved in business where one is not dependent on the other. For example, like during this pandemic time, I'm at my shipping business and it's not dependent the tenants, my tenants not paying me rent has nothing to do with me shipping boxes and vice versa, you know? So I always tried to get myself involved. Like I've seen opportunity where I can buy multiple buildings on the same block. I always try to stay away from that because if that block starts to hurt, then my entire portfolio starts to hurt. So I'd recommend, you know, try to wear many hats, but be able to manage those things because you don't want to be a master of, a jack of all trades and a master of none. So if you know you're spreading yourself too thin, then you have to kind of take an analysis of what's going on and understand that you don't want to be too thinned out, but you still want to diversify yourself. So the next thing we're going to go do is Q&A. How much time do we have? We have basically 10 minutes left. I don't know, Larry, are we, can we do, can people that are listening do um, 
ask a question where everybody can hear like we did with Dion's course or we or that we have that functionality these yes we do uh, we have the question and answer and people can just go into the Q&A on their on their uh, polls people have been doing already and just ask those questions and we'll try to answer as many can, they, can we but can we hear them can they say it into can they can they say it so everybody can hear it or they have to type it not everyone might have an audio so it's better if they just type it in but can we let's start with the the q a you see on the page first because those are the ones that we have gathered from last class um so i feel like those are the ones that deserve to go first since they've been sitting for a couple weeks right and if you have a question to ask please raise your hand let us know and we'll try to answer your question as well but the five questions that we have the first one is managing one's credit during COVID 19. okay well there's two ways i look at it for the first time that i can ever remember in most cases you have a pass where you can be late on some payments and it's not going to affect your credit and, and companies are not reporting to the credit bureau. But in order to do this, and I tell people all the time, I still can't believe people are not doing it. If you know you're going to miss a payment or you're going to be late for a payment, just during these times, you have to call your creditor prior to when the payment is due. And it's simple. It's just business 101. It's managing the expectations, you know, by myself, I didn't pay a couple of credit card payments. I, first time in my life in America, I can say that I've never, I missed some payments, but I called them before ahead of time. I said, Hey, can I get, can I, can I, can I get a def deferment on these payments? And they were more than happy to, but you have to take the initiative and call them first and understand that you could hurt your credit if you just stop making payments and assume that because we're going through this pandemic that it was okay. All right. So, but understand try to come out of the game with great credit you know because and if you do you'll be able to tap in and access that cash is going to be that's available sorry larry you jumped ahead so i would say during the COVID period you have a period in which you can be late or miss a payment but understand you need to be proactive and make that call and just like we talked in the previous seminars some com some companies are deferring the payment and some are, are just allowing you to miss it, but adding on the interest. So you need to be careful and understand what, they're, what those creditors are offering. Oh, wow, 95% of you said yes. Only one person said no. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Even the one that said no, please. Here real me. quick. Um, yes. I would like to say that as you manage your credit, remember you, you, your new normal is, if it wasn't before, to live below your means. You have to live Absolutely. further below your means so you can manage this unexpected economy. So uh, I, I received a Facebook notice of a crowd of people at a, um, at a mall in Atlanta buying the new joint that came out. Now, unless it's a, it's a sneaker you're going to resell, it's something you shouldn't be invested in right now unless you're going to make money and double your profit or double your money by selling the sneakers. I wouldn't, I wouldn't invest or encourage you to take your money and put it in sneakers that aren't important right now. If you're looking to wear them as fashion, you know, um, that money can go to lowering your credit, uh, credit card if you're paying over 20%. So you know, just, just like Mr. A50 said previously, and I'm hearing it amongst my smart investor friends, they're realizing how much things they they're, are of waste. You know how much people are be I've spoken to and just become a minimalist? Like, I don't need all these shoes. I don't need all these clothes. Even myself during this time, I'm coming to work every day and I'm rotating like three pants. And I'm like, people are really becoming, a, this time is really where you're sitting down and checking yourself like, man, I have an exorbitant amount of things that I don't really need. And I'm going to try, I myself threw out six garbage bags on a Sunday cleaning of stuff. So you can begin to understand, you're really what we talk about in all of our classes, understanding your wants versus your needs. Um, educating your own children at home. I think this is so important. You know, I try to teach by example. So with my kids, I'll explain to them, like, you know, when they're leaving lights on, when they're like throwing, wasting food, I explain to them what we're going through, what these times are. So they understand why we're home, why you're not at school, what's happening in the market and to be mindful of that and to be resourceful in what you do. And, you know, my kids, I like to say they're the smartest kids in the world, but you know, I think they're, they're decent. They're getting it. They're connecting and under, putting, like, aligning, putting the dots together and seeing what we're going through. Because you know what's happening to them now? A lot of them now want to go back to school, because, but they understand what's happening and why we can't. So I think this should be ongoing lessons for kids. And this is time we should sit down and teach your kids about budgeting, 
you know, I take my kids to the grocery store with me and help me and have them help me go through what we need from what we don't need. We you know we're cooking more at home. So, excuse me, these are great lessons for kids. And um, um, one more thing to add to our, for those of you guys who didn't tune into our last class, you know, in our last class, we spent all the time talking about Dion spent a lot of time talking about personal branding and also about, you know, upskilling yourself and training yourself. And we talked about a lot of um, <clears throat> different learning resources out there that offer free classes, right? And so if your kids are older, if they're sort of middle school, high school level, I think those classes are perfectly applicable for them, right? Now that we have online learning, it should be easier than ever. And the fact that they're out of school means they have no excuse not to have time. Uh, so... I would encourage tapping into those resources, both yourself and your kids as well. Yeah, and this is a good time for you as a parent to really understand how to teach and how to teach your kids. It's been challenging for me as well. Um, starting an LLC, C Corp, S Corp, sole proprietor and partnership, great time as well. You know, I believe in partnership, tra grouping people together. I see a lot of people doing a lot of socializing online. You know, if you have like-minded people, you have a great idea, now it's time to do the homework and put in the research and check it out. And which option should you choose? You know, I was going to go through them all, but I think with time being limited, I'm going to give myself a plug and I'm going to tell you to go to Two Black Guys with Good Credit and listen to the episode called Legalize It. It breaks down all these different types of um, entities and you could, from that, you'll definitely figure out which one is best for you. Um, but please, with your friends or family, at least have a, a couple, like practice having a couple conversations about business, about the economy, about ideas, because you'd be amazed at all the ideas that you can come up with in this time. When you're doing those Zoom group chats, webinar talking on the phone, like push yourself to have conversation that will propel you. It really, truly makes a difference if you start to force yourself to have these types of conversations with people. Rather than conversations complaining about where we are, how many people have died, what CNN is saying, push yourself each to, to look up stuff, research stuff, and how and bring it to your core group of people and have engaging conversation, then act on that as well. We wouldn't be here today if I didn't, if Dion and myself didn't act on this initiative to start a financial literacy project, pro, a program, a nonprofit. I wouldn't have met Larry, I wouldn't have met Kevin, Adam, Mr. 850, and I can still picture Dion and I walking to uh, the court steps of downtown Brooklyn to register this program so many years ago. So greatness can happen from it. I always say sharing information opens up so many doors. Don't be scared to share with people because it creates opportunity. You know, holding up back an idea, not sharing with anybody, does not, it, that doesn't grow an idea. You have, to, you have to share it and put it out there in the universe and see what happens with that idea. Um, I can cover how for to, I can cover go, go ahead. Um, Okay, go ahead. I think four or five are relevant. So uh, last last year, late last year, we hosted our in-person eight-week class, the standard financially clean class that we always teach. Uh, and we did that at Borough Hall in partnership with the Brooklyn Borough President. As part of that, we also had sort of a four-week, uh, we called it an incubator or a small business incubator, which was where we got a lot of people together who you know, had a lot of ideas during the class, wanted to talk about their businesses and how to get them off the ground, network a little bit, find investors, write a business plan. So, you know, now that I've seen a couple of people ask on, on questions four and five, sort of how to approach investors, uh, what to discuss in a business plan, another shameless plug, attend our main class, and if we get enough interest, we'll, we might do that again, right? But in a nutshell, for number four, Dion also spoke about it last, uh, last week, you got a network, right? Like it's always easier to contact someone um, who's a potential investor who you have a warm lead to rather than someone who you're just cold calling or cold emailing. And this is a perfect time to do that because it's so easy to network online. It's so easy to reach out. And you'll be surprised that some of the weak connections in your network are, are stronger than your, your immediate friends because uh, you know, reach out to your friends, use those second de degree connections and you'll be surprised, I'm, I'm sure, I'll, I'll bet on that. And in terms of what to discuss on a business plan, I don't think we necessarily have time because that in itself can be an entire hour and we do an exercise for that in our incubator, but you know, it's a lot of things. If you, if you just do some uh, Googling of what should be included in a business plan, I think it's, it's pretty self-telling uh, self there. Uh, but I would say just in a nutshell, you know, talk about what you're solving, why you're unique, right? What need is there in the market? 
right? Because ultimately you need supply and you need demand. If you're supplying the solution, you need someone to demand it. And then somehow in the middle, you'll make some money. Uh, you know, talk about your business model, talk about how you're going to make money, who your customers are, who your competitors are and why you're better, right? What are, what money you need from your investors, what resources you need for your, from your investors, the risks and so forth. And so, you know, a business plan is just outlaying and all of that and showing that you've done your homework, right? If an investor, if you go to an investor and say, I have this idea and they ask you how you're going to do it and you say, I'm not quite sure, I'm working on it, that's not very convincing because there's a hundred other people out there who have done the homework, have written everything out and they can give you an answer. And uh, as much as I hate to say it, first impressions matter. So when you're, when you're approaching investors, when you're trying to put together you know, your plan, you, you need to be buttoned up and you need to be prepared. So I think now is a good time to transition. We want to transition, give a shout out to Dion because she just launched her upcoming series. So I'll let her take the start that and talk about what's going on this week. Yes. So if you didn't get a chance to catch it last week, we focused on self-care. Oh, and thank you, Larry, for passing the torch. Um, yeah. So last week we focused on self-care and how important it is in these times. We really be taking care of ourselves, mind, body, and soul. And now that we're, we're all aligned and uh, ready to go, this week, this Thursday, we actually have a uh, negotiation expert, uh, Kwame Christian. So he is an author. He's a TEDx speaker. He has actually the host of the number one negotiation podcast. Um, so he definitely has some authority on the subject. And he's going to be um, helping us navigate conflict resolution uh, in quarantine and so much more. So we're going to look at um, dealing with the difficult conversations with family, uh, in friendships, uh, but also in, in the business and the workplace. So it's going to be really good. Uh, it's going to be interactive. It's going to be uh, <clears throat> a lot of participation. So definitely bring your questions and get ready to do some, some role plays or, and roll up your sleeves. So it's going to be fun. So definitely uh, go to Eventbrite or, like I said, to my... Uh, uh, Facebook or Instagram page at Dion Nichols or at Live Your Best Life for You, and uh, you can sign up there. And it's, again, it's free. So look forward to seeing you. We'll send out an email update with all those details after this, along with uh, along with the quick survey. You know, we I'm sharing the poll results right now for how you know you guys have rated our class, and I'm glad to see that 90% uh, of you guys loved it or thought it was good. Uh, obviously, you know, we want to get better and we want to be better than average. So for the two people who thought we were average, let us know, right? Let us know how we can do better because this is our first time doing it. Um, and again, as Sean mentioned, we have a standard program for financial literacy that we teach that covers more of the basics. We have more time. It's longer. We have more time that we spend talking about credit, specifically each one of those modules that we talk about, you know, education, uh, you know, budgeting, saving, um, uh, and then sort of the mentality of, 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 of being financially literate, that we're going to probably start pretty soon, either late spring, summer, uh, TBD right now. So based on what's going on in, in, in with the states reopening and all that so forth. So again, follow us on social media, subscribe to our email list on our website, and you will get those emails, you'll get those updates. And tell your friends about it, right? Uh, it's, you know, we're really happy to, to pass the word around and you know, we'd love to teach you or any of your friends uh, and stay connected. And with that, one more plug. Sean, you want to plug Two Black Guys with Good Credit? Yeah, I just want to first of all thank everybody that participated in this and, you know, um, for being part of our officially our first webinar. I was a little bit nervous for myself. Um, I think it was great. I learned a lot, actually. I just want to thank the team as well, Larry, Adam, Kevin, uh, Mr. 850, and Dion for being a part of this. Uh, we have special thanks to Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams and his team. And you, the listeners and people that participate in this webinar, thank you guys for your, for your support. Um, and this is good. This is about sharing information and, and trying to grow. So I just once again, thank you, everybody. And please... Your only fee requirement is to listen to our podcast, Two Black Guys with Good Credit. Leave us a favorable review, um, five star, um, and a written comment as well. And, and leave a review also on our Financially Clean page. 
and just listen in for more upcoming events that we plan on doing. So thank you guys. Um, and we'll see you soon. Yep. And then see please soon. Thank you. All right. So long. And uh, to Hi, by the way, for, for making a donation and you see the details on the screen that you just go to financiallyclean.com slash donate. If you want to contribute to us, uh, we rely on you guys and we rely on, you know, generous funding from people like the borough president to help us produce these webinars and our normal classes and teaching in schools. As Sean mentioned, we offer everything free of charge, so there's no obligation. But, you know, if you feel like this was worth your time, uh, these four weeks, then give us a shout out or give us a donation. So, again, thank you. Um, our social media info is, is right here. And hope everyone has a really great night. Have a good night, everybody. All right. So long, everyone. All right. All right thank you.